man wandern ist. Das ist toll, wenn ich den Leicht Focusing it to to your feelings of the past, as soon as the feelings of it do not feel today. Wow, it's a young man, really. Uh, I'd like to start everything from the basic size, from what you've learned in uh, grade nine. In grade 9, we introduced it to parallel lines and there are angles you have to be able to resolve when you have a parallel line. So I'm going to start from those basics. Um, say for instance, we are having line segments A, B being parallel to line segment and let's say C, D, we are saying they are parallel and perhaps we are getting a transversal. Let's say we have an angle there of G, so that we have it in 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then we have, let's say, B, B, E, so that we have E1, 2, 3, and E4. So, when we were taught firstly about um, alternate angles, guys, alternate angles, which we were told we can be able to see them easily. If we are having a line parallel there, parallel there, they form as a sheet. So an angle there will be equal to an angle there, given that the line segments are parallel. So if you are saying it's a star there, it will also be a star. So coming to that case, guys, we will be having our T4, as you can see, which is there it will be equal to our angle E1 and what will be your reason those will be alternate angles guys why alternate angles because A, B will be parallel to C, D so you always have to state which lines are parallel if you are making a conclusion or an assumption if a certain angle equates to that angle because they are alternate angles. Okay, moving to the second one, guys. Um, we were told about corresponding angles that they form a shape of U. So if you have a line segment there parallel to that um, angle, sorry, they do not form U, rather, they form a shape of F. So if you're having a line segment parallel to that line segment, so the, the angles within the Fs would always be equal, why? Because they are corresponding angles, guys. So let's look for corresponding angles there. So if you are taking a look here, it's, a, it's an F. It doesn't have to be a beautiful F. This line segment is parallel to that one. So there, our G3, would be equal to um, our E4. Why are they equal? They are corresponding angles, guys. Why are they corresponding? Because A, B is parallel to C, D. You always have to write this part because the examiners may not even mark you. Okay, let me just do some talks here. I think I forgot um, that I have a few here. So, if you were to go further and, and look for more corresponding angles and alternate angles, you could come to this side because there, there is another F. Rather, it is not beautiful because I told you it does not have to be beautiful. So, if first we were to look for other corresponding angles there, we would see that you would see if would be equal to um, this angle here because it's that angle and that angle. So it's E3 there. Why E3? The same reason they are corresponding angles. Why corresponding angles of AB would be parallel to CT, guys? I'm also coming to other alternate angles. There is another set there. So if you can see this angle and that angle, they are equal. Mm, it 
in Fukushima for and we were I think we had yeah, already talked about those. Uh, there's the other one, if you see this one and this one is that does not have to be beautiful. I'm just going to emphasize to show you the shape of the right here. It's another side there, so this angle will equate to that angle. So we are saying our T3 will be equal to our angle E2. Why, guys? It's the same reason as that first one. They are alternate angles. Why are they alternate angles? Uh, because A, B is parallel to C, D. Coming to the next one, which we say they are called interior angles. We identify this one by identifying the U shape, be it it is based on which direction. This one is the U shape. So basically, what are corresponding? So, what are going to the angles? The um, mathematical unit says when you add angles that are interior or that are within parallel lines, if I like the parallel, you should, when you add this angle and that angle, they should give you 180 degrees guys so if you were to come to the shape you are having this line parallel to this one so this angle and this one when you add them together they must give you um, 180 degrees i'm just going to write it here so i'm just going to say angle g3 plus angle um it's e1 they are equal to 180 degrees why they have corresponding angles? Why corresponding angles, guys? Remember, you always have to state which lines are parallel. So A, B would be parallel to C, D there. Okay, so if you were to look for more other interior angles, you could come to this view shape on this side and um, the edges. So when you add that angle, and at that angle, they should always give you um, 180 degrees. Okay, coming to one other thing, guys, I'm just going to erase here. Um, there's a statement that you guys learned that the angle on a straight line should equate to what I'm sure you guys are already are all saying they should equate to 180 degrees. So an angle on a straight line should equate to 180 degrees guys so if you are having maybe um, a line segment and you knew this angle was 120 degrees and you are asked to find the x there what that statement would you make you know that angles on a straight line should what should add up to 180 degrees there so you have to say your x plus 30 degrees should be equate to 180 degrees. Remember, this is you create in geometry, whatever statement you make, there should be a reason. So, what would be your reason? We are saying this angle and that angle should be at 180. These are angles on a straight line, guys. On a straight line. So, that would be your reason. Or, you might get in, um, in, this, in this topic, you have to get a word for your statement and then you get a separate one for your reason. So if you were to write maybe a statement only, you will not get the total of the question because there will always be marks allocated for a reason. So one other thing I'd like you guys to remind you from the previous grade is talking about um, the exterior angle of a triangle. So for instance, if you have a triangle ABC, uh, let's say you are having D there and you are having um, C1 and C2 there. So basically this theorem or uh, it's a mathematical rule, it says when you want the size of that exterior angle of the triangle, what you should do, you should add the two opposite interior angles. So if I wanted to solve for angle C2, I'd have to add angle A plus angle B. Remember, this is a statement. What would be your reason? Your reason is always say your exterior angle of a triangle size. These are the things you'll have to remember from the previous grades. Um, 
Now let's come here. If I told you that your E1 here was 70 degrees, and I asked you what is the magnitude of that angle E2, then which factor do you use? Um, <coughs> I'm sure you are not saying you'd have to add this angle and that angle in order to get what? 180 degrees, and so in order to get angle E2, you'd have to say 180 minus your 70 degrees. Um, another thing, I'm just going to to remove this one guys, or rather, I'm just going to write here at the top. Um, I want us to talk about vertically opposite angles. What are vertically opposite angles? Um, your vertically opposite angles, you will always find them on a straight line. So, if you are having two straight lines intersecting or rather crossing each other, the angle here will always equate to the angle here. So if you are having maybe let's say that is angle here that is one, two, three and four, your angle E1 would be equal to your angle E3. Why guys? It's vertically opposite angles. So <coughs> I'm sure you can also identify that your angle E2 equate to which angle to angle E4. So these are the basics we are going to need before we move to the theorems that are required in your grade 12 and in your grade 11 and sales examinations. In order to master those questions, you are going to need all of this information. So quickly moving to the first theorem, I'm just going to erase on this so that we can make space. So coming to our first problem guys, I'm just going to, to try to draw something like a circle and not very good at drawing. So the first problem <coughs> talks about the line that moves from a center, um, which is also, let me not put it there. Let me say that is all that is A, B. Say, oh, before that, guys, sorry, I'm not going to re erase this. I want to teach you about the most basics of um, the grade 11 and grade 12 Euclidean geometry. So, we'll be dealing with figures inside the circle. So, I want us to first talk about the circle. Obviously, we are having the center, guys. The center is the most um, I don't think I can explain what a center is, but it is the middle point of that um, center, so of a cycle rather. So it is the middle of the cycle, a center. So we are also having um, the circumference of the cycle. This part here we call it the circumference. Circumference of the cycle. I don't want me to get lost in the technology I'll be using as we are proceeding with this theorem. So that is a center. Any line that moves from the center to the circumference of the circle guys, we call it a radius. So if I were to have another line moving there, moving there, these are all radii. And there is a theorem or a statement or an axiom that says all radii of a cycle are equal. So if you are having the center is O and having that, that point is A, and I give you that um, AO equates to 5 newtons. And I ask you what is the magnitude, say, of line segment of D. Remember, guys, all the radii of the circle are equal. So this question will be very easy. You have to say OA equates to O D both equal to 5 units. And uh, this is a statement still repeated. So what would be your reason equal radii? Because we are saying all the radius of the circle are equal. So equal radii. We are also having what you call um, a chord, guys. What is a chord? A chord is, a, is any line that moves 
from one point of a circumference to the other. So you have to make a note of that it moves from one point of a circumference to another point of a circumference. So any line that you see moving from one point to another, be it in pass to through the center, it will be a chord. But I just want to come to this special um, chord that passes through the center. This special chord that passes through the center of the cycle, remember it will be a chord because it moves from one point of the circumference to the other. But because it is passing through the center, this one divides the center into equal halves. We give it a special name called a diameter drive. It's a diameter. So these are the things I wanted you guys to familiarize yourselves with. Okay, I'm just going to add another one um, called a tangent. A tangent, what is a tangent? It is a line that touches the circle at one point on the circumference only. So this line touched the circle at that one particular point. So this was the terminology I wanted to familiarize with you guys before we moved to the actual theorem we are going to be making. I am not sure if we are going to be able to cover all of them, but I will try to move fast and try to to make sense of what I will be saying. So we come to theorem one guys. Grade 11, grade 1, um, you are going to meet this. So coming to the first theorem, this, this theorem states that I'm not going to write the whole statement, but that I'm going to pronounce it. So this theorem states that any line that moves from the center of the cycle and it it becomes perpendicular to the chord, it should <coughs> bisect that chord. <coughs> Sorry for that. So this theorem says that a line from the center of the chord, from the center of the cycle, perpendicular to the chord, bisects the chord. So perpendicular is in that the line that moves from the center makes an angle of 90 degrees with that particular chord. That that line from the center will bisect the chord. So if you are having OP and that line from the center, it becomes perpendicular to chord AC. Then it comes that like AB will equate to BC. So say for instance, in a statement we are given that your AC equates to 8 units. And for some reason you are required to know what is the length of AB or A or BC when you are performing a calculation. Um, you have to make a statement first that um, your A B equates to BC. So if you were to divide that eight units into two equal halves, guys, what would they make? I'm sure you are saying you would make four units. Remember, guys, this is only a statement. What would be your reason? Your reason would be that a line from center, from center, um, perpendicular to a chord. By sets the chord. That's the complete statement there. You said that line from the center that you are given, because you are also given any degrees, you are told that it is perpendicular to the chord. So it should bisect the chord. At times you may be given BC and you may be required to know what is the actual length of AC, guys. So you only have to reverse that um, statement or the theorem, which brings me to the converse of this theorem. So the converse of this theorem will say if a line from the center of the circle bisects the chord, that line will be perpendicular to the chord. Remember how I wrote it there? I started with the 90 degrees and ended up with the bisect part. So the converse would say if a line from the center um, to the midpoint of the chord, to the midpoint to mean that it 
um, it, it actually divides into two equal lines, so that line will be perpendicular to the chord. Um, another thing that is a special case of theorem 1 and its corners is the Pythagoras theorem. So, most of the time, the calculations you have to perform using um, this theorem would be Pythagoras theorem. You also have to be aware of the fact that right e of the circle are equal. Right e of the circle are equal. Um, actually, we will not be doing any question. The first one has to go through these theorems. Um, I will record another video when we will be performing calculations, guys. So, let us to quickly move to another theorem, which we call a standard theorem. So, this theorem was is that um, an N subtended, sorry, not an N subtended, an angle at the center of the circle is twice the angle at the circumference. So if you are having that angle as O1 and having that angle, I just want you guys to understand this concept of um, sub, sub 10. Sub 10. If I say sub 10, I mean to make sub 10. So the way actually lines make or rather sub 10 angles, if those angles move from different parts of the circumference and join at one place. So if you are having the A, B and C, so you could see that we are having line A, B and line C, B or B, C. So if I say, show me the angle that line A, B and line B, C have subtended. I want you to move from um, the beginning or from the origin of that line of those lines and where they meet, where they form an angle in that angle I'm talking about. So if I I ask you what in which angle did A, B and B C subtend, you need to say it's B. You move your uh, your hands and to the point where they meet at that angle they subtend. So this theorem states that um, when you say it's A, B, C, an angle at the center, which is this angle here, which is O1, will always be twice the angle at the circumference. Which angle is at the circumference is that angle. So what I'm actually saying is that my angle O1 will be two times angle C. Why do you be your reason? Remember, this is the statement. Your reason will be the theorem itself. An angle at center is equal to two times angle at the circumference. Remember, guys, I'm using a shorthand, but uh, the good thing is that I'm also pronouncing them. So, an angle at the center will be twice the angle at the circumference. So. This theorem is not going to always come um, straightforward as it is sometimes. So, what do you have to do in order to identify when they are asking you about the standard theorem? Is that you have to do exactly what I did. You look at the lines that move at the center to um, to the to different points of the circumference and look where they meet. So, when they moved from the center. They formed that angle which is O1, and when they rejoined at the circumference, they formed that angle. So I'm just going to make a different example where we are going to be able to identify. So we are saying we look at lines that move from the center to different points of the circumference and look where they meet again at the circumference, those lines. So even if it were to move to this side, and I slide, so say for instance I'm having O1 there, I'm having angle B, it will still be your standard theorem. Your angle O1 there would be two times angle B there. That's how it could also be shown. I'm just going to uh, to draw another one. I'm not sure if it will be visible, but I'm just going to, to draw it here. You look for lines 
right move from the side um how do I pronounce this? Um let me just make it here. Yes, yes, yes. You look for two lines, those are the lines that you move to the left and they also meet where at the circumference and subtend an angle. So which angle would you be talking about? That would be twice which angle. Remember this is the angle at the circumference. Now which angle is at the center? It would be this angle here. So if you are saying that this angle O1 and that is 2 and that is making angle B, your angle O1 would be twice angle B guys. So these are three different cases where I'm going to be questioned on the center theorem. I hope this makes sense. Um, now moving to another theorem, guys. Remember, we are only covering the basics of the of the theorem. And before we approach the actual theorem, I want you guys uh, to first be familiar with the following. Remember, we said the diameter is a line that moves from one point of the cycle or rather from one point of the circumference and passes through the center. Now there is an axiom, it is not a statement per se, an axiom. An axiom, what is it? It is a statement that is made by mathematicians or scientists. So this is not a statement more than a theorem. So there is a statement that says a diameter will always obtain an angle of 90 degrees at the circumference. So we have to notice which one is your diameter. You will be able to notice which one is a diameter. You just look at it and look if it passes through the center. Guys, do not presume that a line is a diameter unless you are told so or at least you identify the center. There are times when you'll be given a diagram and the line will look like a diameter but if you are not having a sign of that circle or being told that it is a diameter, do not presume or assume that it is a diameter. So, you are saying an angle that a diameter subtends at the, at the circumference will be 90 degrees. So, say for instance, that is angle A say that is angle A1. So if you wanted to make a statement or you are asking what is the angle of, what is the magnitude of size angle A1, you have to say angle A1 equates to 90 degrees. Remember this is a statement, what would be your reason? So your reason would be that um, angle by diameter or angle is attended by a diameter. Um, other books will tell you that it is angle in a semicircle. So any of those guys is acceptable angle in semicircle. Any of those is acceptable. Okay, moving to that to this theorem I wanted us to talk about. Um, I'm not sure which one I wanted to talk about but I'm just going to randomly pick um, the one that crosses my mind. I wanted us to talk about um, a tangent, guys. Remember, I said a tangent is a line that touches the circle at one point. So I'm not really good at drawing, as I've been saying, but that line was supposed to touch the circle at one point. So actually, this theorem is the tangent theorem. It is the tangent chord. Theorem. Let's say you are having A, B, C, and D, E. So basically, this theorem states that an angle between a tangent, remember our tangent here is D, E, and a chord, any chord with which it becomes in contact. So a chord here would be C, B, or A, C, or other C, A. So it says an angle between a tangent and a chord. Let's start with this one. It says that the angle between a tangent and a chord will be equal to the angle that is subtended by that chord. Remember, I'm going to say it again, an angle between a tangent and a chord 
what is we're talking about this end will be equal to the end subtended by this chord. How did we say identify the end subtended by a chord? We move um, our hands and join the two lines that move from them. So if you were to move our hands like that, we find out that um, chords will be subtended this end. So this goes further to say that um, N with B, C, E equates to N with A. And what would be your reason, guys? Remember, this is the tangent chord theorem. So the theorem itself is a reason. So I will only, yeah, it is essentially to short write this as a time chord theorem. Or rather, time chord only. Okay, let's make another example. This theorem states that an end between a tangent and a chord, let's talk about this chord this time. So we'll be talking about this end. Equates to which end, you guys? Equates to the end that is subtended by this chord. Which end is subtended by this chord? Let's move our, end, our lines from where they originate from this line and where they meet. There. So this N will be the N is attended. So we could go further to say that um, N B C D equates to N B. What is the reason? The same reason is the tangent chord theorem, guys. Okay, so I'm also going to add matrix for grade 11. You could be questioned this way. They could say prove that um, line D C E is a tangent. To that circle. So prove that line segment to C E is a tangent to that circle. So guys, you never ask to prove anything. Um, to prove that this line is a tangent, you have to support it with facts. So this time, uh, when you ask to prove that something is that thing, you are asked to use that theorem. So in, in trying to answer this question, you have to use the tangent chord theorem itself. In fact, you have to use its converse. You have to prove that this end here equates to that end. I don't know how, but using a mathematical rules, or you could prove that this angle is equal to that angle. Guys, do not use the fact that that angle is equal to that because it is the tangent chord theorem. Remember, you are asked to prove that this is a tangent. It is not a tangent, but in order for it to be a tangent, that angle needs to equate that, to that one, and that angle needs to equate that one. So try to prove that those angles are equal. After that, you could say, therefore, that line is a tangent. The reason it would be the converse of time chord theorem. Um, I will make a more um, or another video on dealing with these questions. So I'd like us to move from this. Okay, let's not move. Let's just make an example. So if I had here a tangent, um, say for instance, I'm having A, B, C, D, E, but I'm having that thing there being 30 degrees, and we are asked to find the magnitude of that um, angle A. So what would you actually do in order to answer that question? The tangent chord says an angle between a tangent and the chord, which is this angle, should be equal to an angle subtended by this chord. Which angle is subtended by this chord? The lines in there, so that angle will also be 30 degrees. If you are given 40 degrees there and asked to find the magnitude of angle B, what would you do? So you have to move your, your, your hands towards uh, the meeting of those lines. When do they meet? They meet there. So what would be your angle there? It would also be 40 degrees. Since I'm already talking about tens of guys, I want you to introduce to a fact that um, your right ears, remember I said the right ears is the middle line that moves from the center of the circle to the chord, sorry, to the circumference. So your right ears is always perpendicular to a tangent line. So in this statement, I'm trying to say um, when you see a radius, given that you like to find that the line is a radius meeting with a tangent, the angle that would be between the meeting or at the point of meet would always be 90 degrees. That was um, uh, perpendicular. So I'm guessing that's clear. It's another axiom. I'm going to add more as we go further. 
So I want us to go to cycle quad lateral endurance. Cycle quad lateral endurance, guys. So what is actually a quad lateral? It's a, a quad lateral. Remember, we said it's any four sided figure. It's any four sided figure. Now, what do we mean by a cycle quad lateral? We are saying that four sided figure should be within a cycle with its four vertices touching what um, the cycle. For instance, I'm having a quad lateral. I don't know what it is, but I know that it is a quad lateral because it has four sides. I'm not saying they are equal by drawing those lines. In order for it to be a cycle quad, it needs to have its four vertices on the right, on the circumference of the cycle. Hence, we call them cycle quad lateral. So there are theorems that come with um, cycle quad lateral. Uh, introducing you to the first theorem of cyclic quadrilateral. This theorem states that the opposite interior angles of a cyclic quadrilateral are supplementary. By supplementary, I mean that when you add those angles, they should give you 90 degrees. If I say opposite, you move from that one to that one. If I say opposite, you move from that one. So this theorem would say that any B plus any C is equal to 180 degrees. I've already introduced it to the theorem, so this is a nice statement. What would your reason be if you wanted to um, to write the statement? It would be the opposite um, angles of a cyclic quad equates to 180 degrees straight forward. This goes um, the same for angle A and angle B. So if you were to add angle A plus angle G, uh, you have to get 180 degrees. This is a statement. What would be your reason, guys? Yes, it is the same. Opposite angles of a cycle quite a supplementary. I hope you got that theorem, guys. Um, I think I'm running out of talk. Uh, okay, we are going to use the little we have. Coming to the next theorem, guys, of a cycle quite lateral. This talks about the exterior angle. Uh, I may be spoiled, but I'm hoping it's going to be visible on the video. This talks about the exterior angle of a cycle quadrilateral, which is that angle. So this theorem is if that um, the exterior angle of a cycle quad equates to the interior opposite angle. The exterior angle of a cycle quad which will be that one in this case. So let's say it's BC, let me put E there. So angle BCE will be equal to, to the opposite. Which one is the opposite interior angle? Remember, we are saying BCE that right, is equal to the interior opposite. Which one is the opposite? Which is that one. So we are, angle, we are saying angle BCE equates to angle A. Whatever the magnitude of um, angle A should also equate to angle BCE. The opposite is true, guys. So I'm just going to, to draw another line here. So let's say this is a straight line and you're having an angle there. And the exterior angle of the cycle quad should equate to the interior opposite, which is the interior opposite of this exterior angle. Remember, you move from that angle and go to the straight opposite. So this angle would equate to that one. Um, if I were to extend the line there again and ask what is the magnitude of that angle, you'd have to say it equates to the opposite. If I were to extend there and ask what is the magnitude of that angle, you'd have to tell me that it equates to the opposite. What would your reason be, guys? The reason is the statement is the theorem is itself, uh, so it will be the exterior angle of a cyclic quad. I'm hoping you are getting all that, guys. Um, that is, uh, those are the theorems that I included in the cyclic quad. Coming uh, to the next one of the uh, let me just make some space here. I'm just going to erase the first one. 
to finish the theorems of the cyclic part. So there is another word of the cyclic part that says um, n is in the same segment are equal to each other. So if I was having if I was having A, B, C, D, let's say I'm having A1 and 2, B1 and 2, D1 and 2, C1 and 2. Um, basically what this theorem states that it is states that uh, I forgot to talk about what a segment is. A segment um, is an area between two points when a circumference is an area, guys. You are having this point here, you are going to make an example, and you are having that point here. So a segment would be this area here, this whole area there. So this is the same segment. So if you are having lines or like angles that are subtended by the same segment, those uh, angles would be equal. So remember, let's go back to the concept of subtending. We are saying we move from those L points um, from where the lines meet. It will be that angle that is subtended by that segment. So if we were to move firstly, so we we'll see that this angle is subtended by the segment. And if we were to go back again, we'll see that there are other two chords that move there, that meet there. So we are having those two angles subtended by that area, or rather by those points C, D. So this, thing, this theorem states that angles in the same segment are what are equal. So we are saying angle A, um, angle A2 equates to angle B2. What is the reason? It is the theorem itself. Angles in the same side. Angles in the same side. So that would be your, your statement there. I just want to look for more to see if I can have blood and find them. Um, Guys, you have to forgive me. I think I'm going to to pause this video because I've ran out of chunks. But let me just finish the theorem so that we move on to something when we come back. Okay, let's explain more about the concept of uh, angles in the same segment. So, if you were to come to point D, sorry B and D and you try to which ends are subtended by that area you see that when you move your lines that meet the first end A1 um, you also see that there are other lines that move there and form that angle so we are basically saying that angle A1 um, equates to which angle? angle C2 what is the reason? because this is statement angle is in the same segment guys I hope that um, that is clear enough. Um, I don't want to write more. So I'm just going to add other facts or axioms you are going to need um, on the on the ingredients you need because I have covered many of the theorems you are going to need. So What I'll be adding is that, um, what will I actually be adding? I want to add a theorem that says that equal chords, if you are having equal chords in a circle, so say for instance I'm having that chord as A, B, I and mean, I'm having another chord there as maybe, even if you do not need to uh, not to insert in a circle that one, but if you are having A, B equating to B, E, those line segments, or rather those chords, guys, will subtend equal angles. So if this line were to form um, an angle there, or to subtend an angle there, which is, I will call it C, and that line was to subtend another angle at the circumference. Remember, we said subtend 
where the lines meet at the angle that is from where we say that angle is subtended. So this time I'm just going to say it's G. So because of AB is given as equal to BE, the angles that each chord will subtend will be equal to the other. So let's look at uh, which line. Which angle did B is attended? Remember, that's where the lines meet. So we are saying angle G is attended by B. So it should be equal to the angle is attended by A B. Which angle is attended by A B? Let's look at the mid, the mid at C. So the angle G will be equal to C. What should be your reason? Angles subtended by the same chord. Sorry, by equal chord subtended. By equal chords. So you are going to need that. Uh, remember, you are not going to to be given them a straightforward the time you may first be asked to calculate the magnitude of A B and the A C rather. And if they are equal, you can make a conclusion that they are the angles they will subtend will equate to each other. And what else did I want to add? Oh, I wanted to add the fact that um, what did I want to add? I wanted to talk about triangles because before I remember another theorem, uh, I remember I really started this lesson to talk about something on triangles. Remember, in triangles, you said when you add all the angles, you should always get what. 90 degrees. So if say what is angle A, what is B, what is C? So angle A is plus angle B plus angle C um, add up to 180 degrees. This is true for any type of triangle, guys. This is true for even right angle isosceles and scaling triangles. So remember that is a statement we are saying when we add those angles. All the angles of the triangle they should add up to 180 degrees. So what would be your reason? And say it's sum of angles of a triangle. The way I wrote them, um, the reason the way I wrote them are uh, up short. Uh, I have shorthand written them, but they are also acceptable in your examination, in your X ray examination. So you can write them just the way I write them. Uh, what else did I want to add about triangles? Um, let's see. Mm. Guys, I think I mentioned the most basic things. Remember, we said these are the basic things. We are going to come to the application of these theorems in the next video we are going to be having. So, I'd like to give a special thanks to Melanie for offering us a venue to record this video. Um, I hope you guys have learned a lot from it. We are going to come with another to show you how to apply all these theorems. I'm not sure if you've covered all of them, but you've covered most of them. So this is it from, from us guys. So thank you for watching the last video. Please don't forget to subscribe. Um, leave your comments in the comment section. Um, your support will be very much appreciated by us. So thank you.